let's talk about it. Hello and welcome back to Thick Radio, the podcast where we talk about gaining, fetism, and everything in their orbit. I'm James. And I'm Tim, so let's get into it. Today we're welcoming to the show for the first time, we're welcoming Edward. Hello guys, how's it going? Good, how are you? Uh, not that bad, not that bad. It's pretty shady in Vancouver today, so it's okay today. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. We're good on this end. And listen, we're very keen to talk to you today, Ed. So shall we Shall we get crack and You ready for this? Oh, yeah. 100%. Fabulous. So listen, today we are talking about the gaining on like the broader fetish spectrum, right? We're kind of figuring out a little bit about where this fits into the scheme of things. We're going to be digging into a little bit of that. So let's just kick things off. For you, how does the concept of gaining fit into this broader scheme of fetishes so i would like to think that it's probably depending on different people but for me it's like a very it's a fetish for me i like the idea of like you know when people are gaining weight that's like really hot <laughs> so i try to i try to understand for other people too because for me for me when i was started gaining it was not because of the act of sexual or you know, it's because, you know, growing up, I was anorexic and had a lot of bulimia. So when I started gaining, it's because I wanted to be in a healthy state and, you know, actually having weight on me so I can actually be healthy and everything. So it, for me, it wasn't sexually, but for other people, it was. So, you know, I try to, you know, at least try to be open about that. But for me, it was actually more of a, you know, personal hygiene kind of you know thing you know physical health thing so yeah but did you have any um previous like attraction to fatness bellies anything like that like before you started gaining like as as sort of puberty comes on and you're switch i mean and, and not to assume that you're you know allosexual but like as as those sort of fascinations grow during the, the time of puberty um had you had any prior interest in that Oh, 100%. Yes. Okay. <laughs> 100%. Uh, I remember watching a bunch of shows where, you know, the cartoon character was gaining weight for fun or for like a comic roof, like, you know, thing. But for me, it was very like, you know, it was such a turn on for me because I was like very young at the time. And I, when I first saw, you know, an episode of a cartoon and they, we're gaining weight and then I was just like okay <laughs> I don't know why but I'm sexually attracted to that so it, it was a very um interesting thing for me to realize that I was into it at first if I thought it was just a one-time thing until well 20 years later <laughs> here I <am>. yeah. <laughs> which I I kind of love that that's such a common narrative among members of the community I don't know if it's as common for like maybe the gen x gays or the the generation that came before them like because there's something about 80s and 90s cartoons that i feel like a lot of fetish writers were in those writing rooms and just were pl were planting seeds we've said it many times on the show that like every gainer from a certain age is able to like recall a cartoon that they saw once or like a comic book character that they saw once and it just like sparked the whole thing <laughs> And for me, as well as I guess, I've always liked the bigger guys, even without watching cartoons or anything like that. Apparently, when I was younger, my mom was always like, "You always liked the bigger guys. You've made them. You you always felt safe around them." So <laughs> I was like, "Okay." She's like, "I already knew. I already knew you were gay when you were like two years old." But you always, it, for me, it was always like, I guess I was always comfortable with the bigger guys. I guess so. Even before I even was exposed to cartoons or anything like that, it was just was it was was <laughs> you know it's funny you mentioned that my second boyfriend he was this gorgeous moldy fijian guy and i distinctly remember going around to his auntie's house his auntie had just had a boy and this boy was obsessed with their bellies like would not leave his mum's belly alone would not leave his uncle's belly alone and because like 
Clint knew about the gaining, and so like he had told her, and like I didn't care. We were just kind of like, well, they looked at me and they were like, "Is that is that boy?" And I was like, "That boy could very well be into something you finna find out in a couple years." So uh, if you out there listening, buddy, <laughs> but listen, I I think it's really interesting that you know, and we talk about this a lot. How so many of us have this fascination from a time when we were just too young to be sexual. So I feel like the adoration of gaining and fetism have to go beyond the sexual. It has to dip into something more human and emotional and visceral, not just like that, you know? I mean, considering that it implants itself at such a young age, you know, like seven, eight, nine, maybe, you know, like you're not, you're, you're not going through puberty at that age. So like, it's clearly not linked to um, libido, but it's but for a lot of us during puberty it does become linked to libido you know yeah. so it's it is fascinating you know and we've talked to a lot of different people um in the in these three seasons and like they they've fallen into any place on the sexual spectrum of like whether or not um they're in the middle of the road or hyper or, or um ace so you know with it with it existing in the um the 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 uh the sub subconscious of people who aren't even interested in sex period it can't possibly just be a sexual thing. Like James was saying, it's got to have the, it's got to have these really, really deep roots. And uh, I'm still searching for someone who can give me the answer as to why. Yeah. Like even if I wasn't, I guess it, my first fetish I would ever say was probably belly buttons. My apparently my, my parents said I'd always used to play with them when I was younger. So even before I was sexually inactive or anything like that, even the thought of sexual was not even clear to me at all at the age of two. Apparently I was always playing with them, always was interested in them. So it was very, yeah, it's weird how that works because it's like, I'm not, I'm just two years old. <laughs> how could I even have the idea of just, you know, me liking that, you know, it's a very interesting topic for sure. That's for sure. Mm. And I, I like this because obviously what we're trying to ascertain here is like there is a deep, carnal, emotional, some kind of human link to this love and appreciation for something that inevitably seems to wind up on the fetish spectrum for many of us. But to put it out there, when it comes to other fetishes, like, and in this I'm talking more about like fetishes separate to gaining that we don't have for ourselves. Do you feel like we approach them with the same kind of respect that we have for gaining, or does there tend to be a little bit of a side eye going on? Um, I am, I am guilty of being, you know, not accepting it at first. I have definitely. It took me a while to even accept that it was a thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I. I always knew after when I was exposed to many of those things and I was just like, how could I like that? It made me feel weird at first. It took me, it took me a while, honestly, to even like come to terms. And then when YouTube was actually the best time for that in like 2010, I believe, <laughs> when YouTube was peak of like the gaining stuff and all stuff about YouTube and don't care about, you know, posting videos about that now. YouTube sucks now for it, so. <laughs> but yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I think you have to be at least exposed to it for a bit before you slowly kind of open your mind to it. You know, I think it should definitely be a slow process because for me, it was it took me a couple of years to even accept that even I was gay, even that I liked bigger men that it was a sexual fetish for mine. So I definitely think it's something you have to take your time with to fully understand and fully embrace yourself with this um, community because it's a very taboo community, if I'm, in my opinion. I mean, it is interesting that you say that, I think, because we, we, we find ourselves circling this conversation quite a bit. When we talk about gaining in like this kind of broader sexual narrative, a lot of people feel like it's this you know, wicked and evil thing deep down that we're all kind of struggling with, but it's like, it's actually very vanilla in the grand <laughs> things. Like some people be out here, like I need you to take a doctor's saw to my kneecap and just slice it off. And I can't come without blood and sinew dripping from my stump leg. <laughs> we are like, I just want to be bad. 
Yeah. I, just, like, I know people that want to be fist that want to be fisted. I know people that want to be tied up. I know people that want to be uh they, they want to they're into rope play, knife play, even blood play, fire play, things like that. Things that are genuine like genuinely dangerous. Mm. And like, you know, gaining is still seen as so taboo just because of societal norms and fat phobia. You know, and yes, of course, we all know the health argument, blah, blah, blah. We've gone around and around with the the health argument. But, you know, I, I'm sorry, but eating a whole cheesecake is, is significantly less dangerous than letting somebody set you on fire. Yeah. I, <laughs> I also refuse to believe that people actually give a shit about fat people's health if we're still circling the idea of, like, is smoking actually bad for you? Like... Everyone's out here talking about the science and everything else, and yet every generation picks up the smokes and suddenly becomes the new cool thing, even though it's bad for you, and now vape culture is a thing. And it's like, baby, like, there are things causing way, way worse harm to us, and no one gives a fuck. So why is everyone, like, super intent on, like, what a fat person puts in their body? Obvious reasons, right? Um... Mm -hmm. But I think it is important that we all kind of own our own biases, right? Because, again, today we're talking about in the broader fetish spectrum. And I, I, I like what you did at first, Ed, where you like, I've got to admit that there are times when I know that I come to things with a bit of bias. And we all do. You know, yeah. I mean, we have to be willing to acknowledge on this podcast that, for example, we did an, uh, an episode back in season one on the expectoration kink, which is burping, stomach noises, but also farting. And Tim and I, this is not a kink for either one of us, but there are probably plenty of people in the community for whom that is a key tenant of what brings arousal and pleasure and satisfaction. And so we have to be mindful. We can't be putting our biases and judgment on this because that's someone else's yum. Do not yuck people's yum. And so this is always a good reminder for everyone listening. Like if you come across something that is not for you, baby, change the channel. Like you do not need to voice your chagrin Keep it in. Your mama told you you don't have anything nice. Don't say anything at all. That this is the moment. And, and don't make any assumptions about people who are into a certain thing. Because um, like I've talked about Claw, the leather event that I go to every year in Cleveland. There is a very sweet guy named Piglet who is really, really, really into scat. That is his most favorite thing in the world. And he's a lovely person. You can have a great conversation with him. He's very kind. I just don't want to participate in his particular fetish. And he understands that. And he's like, hey, it's not for everybody. It's my thing. It didn't have to be yours. But, you know, I think on top of not particularly liking something, we do make those immediate decisions about the person who's into it. Like, oh, well, then they must be like really fucked up if they're into that. Like, no, that's just another facet of, of what gets them off. And it has nothing to do with their overall personality or their approach to the world. Mm. A bad person's a bad person. Yeah. A good person's a good person. And what someone is into when it comes to the king spectrum is no determinant of that. We cannot ever use that because if we do, then we're just using the same rhetoric that people use about us. Yeah. And if we have the audacity to sit there and complain that people think little of us for being into gaming, we can't then go around and put that on other people. So we got to break the cycle there, peeps, right? Just a little, little heads up for everybody. On that point of there being different fetishes, let's talk a little bit about the intersectionality of it all. Because there, it often feels like people who are into gaining are into multiple things. Like, f for the pair of you, what do you feel like are the most common intersections with gaining and other forms of kink that you see? Um, I definitely see a lot of BDSM. You know, that, that idea of being tied up, being force-fed. That's definitely deals with BDSM because I like that. That I like. <laughs> that I definitely know that I like. And there's also people who who are furries, and they also love bloating. They also love inflation. They also love turning to blueberries and stuff like that, right? And so, and then there's also what else? Balloon play. That's a pretty big one I would say too as well because that inflation, that noise, and that you know that idea of just you know I guess it's the idea of just being getting bigger, something like that, right? And then there's also, I would say, pups as well. I know a lot of pups who are into that. So I, it's like you know, when they both interconnect, I like that. I like the idea that you can be more than just one, you know? That's like a whole open book you're, I'm ready to read, you know? <laughs> I'm like, okay, you're interesting. You're, you're playful. You're, 
you know, open-minded and stuff like that. And that I do like when people are, they just don't, they don't pull back. You know, I like when they like to put multiple things in like, you know, with multiple kinks and stuff like that. That I do find pretty interesting. And I would echo all of that. Like, and I think even on the most basic level, it's a dominant and submissive kind of situation. Like if you, even if you're solo, you could be sub or dom. You know, it's whatever you feel in the moment. But, you know, like typically if you're with uh, another gainer, another a feeder, an encourager, whatever the other designation is, it's like it does tend to take on that kind of role. Like if you're the one that is the gainer and you want to be fed, you are putting yourself in a submissive position. You're handing the control over to someone else and someone else is telling you what you should eat or how much you should eat or, you know, what to do in that particular play scenario. And then I think that that's probably just the root of all of it, you know, and that that, of course, translates into thousands of other fetishes and and kinks, because there's always going to be that dynamic one way or another. 100 percent. When I think about kinks, I feel like I'm most commonly seeing intersecting with gaining pups is definitely right up there. Um, but leather and rubber have to be two of the other big ones that I see often intersecting. And, you know, we've talked about this in different episodes. I'm sure we talked about this in our uh, Fabrics and Feelings episode. I know we talked about this in the Suits episode. You know, there really is something about the use of size and dimension when it comes to any kind of tactile material, the way that the body responds, the way that things are different, especially when there's transformation and growth, the use of inflation, right? It makes a lot of sense that there would be crossover here. Is there an intrinsic issue with operating with uh, different communities within gainer spaces when these spaces are designed specifically for gainers? No, I don't think so. I think that it's, I find that when in a gainer space is everybody's on a different spectrum, right? And so it's not, you don't need to be only just into gaining. We don't need only just to be you know, an inflator and a bloater, a, a, you know, an encourager or anything like that. So I think it's our spectrum, um, the gainer thing is, should this be open to everything, right? Because when I came into this community, I was only into belly buttons and the bellies. I was curious <laughs> at the age at 14. And when I came into this Saying I only was into a few things, and then when, when opening up to that, I found that I was a lot more into other things coming into that. So I think I don't know if it shouldn't just be explicitly it's only for gamers. I think it should be able for anybody to explore their, their sexuality. Right? They should be exploring that and say like you know I wasn't into bloating or inflation before. I was never into that. Nor was I into you know, underwear before, you know, like exploding clothes or something like that, you know, I was never into that until I finally found out when I was going deeper and deeper into this community, I found out like, okay, <laughs> I have a lot more, I, I, I'm i a lot more and I didn't, and then it's slow, my, I slowly turned into this person where I, I went from having like two very prominent fetishes to having a whole bunch, I have a whole bunch now. I didn't even realize that there was even like transformation kinks either. I don't know that either until I was, you know, curious. I did my a little bit of my research, you know, one night, late night, <laughs> and I was 14 on my laptop and stuff like that. And yeah, I found a lot of things I was into um, with the help of this community because, you know, I think it's, it's great to like let your book still be open. No matter how many fucking things you put on the list and it's still going. I think I'm still discovering some things that I'm still into that I didn't even realize before. So I think exploring your sexuality within this gaining spectrum should be open. I, I, I love that gaining is kind of a, a, a doorway to a lot mm -hmm. of other things. Because like even if you only ascribe one label to yourself throughout your entire existence within the community, you are at least aware of so many other things. Because there's so many other boxes that get ticked off and there's so much other kind of content that goes along with it, you know, and tastes evolve. You know, the more you explore your sexuality, the more things can change for you. Like you were just saying, you're discovering things about you that you're into that you didn't know you were before. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of exposure, but other times it's just sort of a natural evolution of keeping an open mind and being 
um, uh, receptive to other people's ideas on kinks, fetishes, whatever turns them on. Um, just having a discussion about it, you might consider, oh, well, I never thought of that before, but maybe that's something I could be into. I often use my uh, beta puppy as an example of this because when I met him, he was pretty much only into, um, he wasn't really even fully a gainer. He was like, yeah, I've always, you know, kind of played around with it, but never been committed. The only thing that he was really into was pup. But in the course of knowing him, like it went from like, not only is he now into uh, both gaining and being a puppy, but he's into being uh, dominated. He's into like, he loves to tie my boots. <laughs> and um, he also loves to lick my boots, you know, and I think it's exceptionally cute. And like every time we meet up, he's 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 usually got something else that he's discovered. He's like, I blame you for this, for opening the door. And I'm like, I just opened the door, honey. You walked through it. You know, this is part of your journey. But how glorious to open the door and discover so much more. I mean, I feel like when I discovered that I was into fat men as a young person, it freaked me out because I was in that closeted space. I did not understand the size element of it all because of internalized fat phobia. And that took me a while to come around to it. But it was because I came around to it that I realized, oh, I can gain for myself. That was transformative. Literally, my mind and my heart and my body. It's been incredible. And so any other kink can do that for you too. And how incredible to continue discovering it as you grow as a person, literally and figuratively. And, you know, Tim, to your point about like, it, it really seems to be like a nexus point for so many things. I think it is because so many kinks and fetishes and angles of sexuality are dependent on specific notions. Whereas what we are is the body itself, right? Like we are the broad body. All we are is transforming this space. So, I think that's why so many kings can hinge off this because we kind of are uh, malleable, right, to fit into different categories, but also because we are transforming into something that we love and value and appreciate, we're sitting in that joy so much more, so we are more open to receiving the good vibes from other kinks and fetishes, and even if they're not for us, just going, oh, I've never tried rope play before. But you know what? I'm really interested. I'm feeling so good about myself. Let me, let me let me try role play. Let me see what happens. And I think that can be such a wonderful way to expand literally into this further understanding of the self, right? Now, I know we mentioned before about like challenging ourselves to be less judgy about other kinks. In yours opinion, do you feel like the community maybe has a bit of an issue when it comes to kink shaming of other non-gainer kinks or possibly even other gainer kinks within the space? I have definitely been guilty of kink shaming, that's for sure. I can't just say, but like, you know, I have kink shamed people before, and sometimes it's like, I feel bad about it, but at the same time, it's, it makes me an asshole for saying this, but like, there's some things I believe in that I believe in, in a lot of kink shaming. There's a spectrum <laughs> on those. There should be some things, some things, not all of them, because that's who they are, right? But for me, I, I, I sound like an asshole saying that, <laughs> but it's like, I don't, I, I, I have a, a huge spectrum of the, the things that I agree on, the things that I think that are, you know, that you're allowed to do that. But there's a spectrum of where, where people, you know, are into, you know, bestiality. That I definitely can show <laughs> because I is just I just don't I I find that a little bit extreme, and you know I feel like you know there are some things that I believe that you you, you can kinship for. Well, I mean, you know, there are certain things we know that go on that that do not involve consent, right? That's that's yeah. really what it comes down to. The ones that are illegal are the ones where the it, the individual that it's being done to cannot consent and those we we know that those are wrong because you're taking away agency you know you're not giving um another human being or in you know in the case of an animal they can't give consent because they can't talk so you know like we we know about those ones um yeah I'm, I'm of the opinion that if if what you're into is not illegal unethical taking away someone's consent well it's I, I kind of feel weird saying unethical because like that's an entire debate on on the ethics of of like is it ethical to be fat you know blah 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 but like if it's not illegal it's not taking away anyone's agency it's not bringing any direct harm to someone then i don't care what you get up to 
behind closed doors or even in public for that matter, because we know Folsom Street Fair is a thing and they're all out in public doing their whatevers. Yeah. So, and that's a comment on consent and even things like role play come into that because I think sometimes people can get wires crossed with what themes are conveyed in a role play, like ABDL communities and even the concept of like everybody now calls a dude daddy. Like the implications there are incestuous and, you know, of a certain nature. And it's like, well, if we know ontologically that we're not committing any kind of that act in the moment when we just kind of throw that language around, like we can use a bit of sense to know that there is a line discernibly between like pleasure and something that is actually socially acceptable and totally fine to engage in versus something that is, like you say, non-consensual and inappropriate. And CNC, consensual non-consent, yeah, I was going to mention that too, is that's also a thing, because there are people who do have fantasies about being forced or coerced into something. Yeah, I have not taken part in anything like that. However, I feel like if I ever did, like, that's the kind of thing where you, I feel like you almost need an ironclad contract. Like, I need it in writing that you, this is what you yeah. want. It's it, like one of the most common role plays that people want to engage in is rape role play. Right. But the trick, like the, the key word there is role play. This isn't the real thing. This is yeah. fantasy. It's make believe. Um, and I do think, you know, on that point, you know, is there some bias in the community? I think maybe a little bit, you know, because so many of us were in a, you know, an echo chamber of people who feel the same way that we do about gaining. And of course that's supportive, but then someone voices dissent and goes, oh, well, you know, uh, blueberry God, like why? But then it has a space. And as you said before, Ed, like a blending of the spaces means that people have more of an equal opportunity to find their way into gaining and realize more about themselves. So it's a good the type of shaming. The type of shaming that I see happen sometimes that really needs to fucking stop is where um, like someone decides, like if they've been a gainer for a while, then they decide that they want to lose weight. That's we oh, got to yeah. stop okay. shaming people for that. Like. Yes. That's really got to stop. And I'm not saying that people are out there literally posting someone's picture and going, oh, this person's a phony. We shouldn't care about them, yada, yada. But it's the little microaggressions that people like that get on their on their posts that they that they will put up. Like, you know, someone saying very flippantly, oh, I liked you when you were bigger. Why do you want to lose weight now? It doesn't fucking matter why they want to lose weight. Okay, that's their body. That's their decision. I understand this the kind of like tinge of disappointment that comes from that. But that's not okay to then voice it off on that person and be like, make them responsible for for your fantasies and, and, and what you, you know, would have liked to have seen them do. That's not okay. That's got to stop. Yeah. Yeah, no, I have actually had a few messages like that where where I was just like, oh, I'm losing weight. Oh, you look better when you're fat. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, like, okay, like, that's your opinion, but that's not mine because... You know, <laughs> I've I've definitely had my fair share of messages where people told me that, and I was like, okay. And how many I, how many examples do we see of people just over the years of their of their time in the gainer community? They may pick it up, put it down, lose weight, gain weight, yo yo, whatever. It's all fine because it, it, at at the core of everybody who's in this community, we all love fat. Yeah, that is the core thing. That right, that's the through line. For the entire community is that we love fat doesn't fucking matter what your body looks like we all love fat so there is no point in that particular type of shaming that happens yeah i mean we're all uh, what is it you've said before tim like we are the outcasts of the outcasts like why are we trying yeah. to keep it down again we're a subgroup of a subgroup what is the point of infighting like i, I i've said before um the i think the total number of users on grammar like registered is somewhere around 75,000. That is a drop in the ocean when you compare it to world population. Yeah. Yeah. Well, That's I'm... not even like a small town. <laughs> Literally that and baby do do the uh the, the communication styles not mimic a small town where everybody's trying to be in everybody's business about all this kind of stuff like oh did you hear about her? Think about it. Like everybody take a deep breath. We have got war happening in multiple countries right now. We have got economic crises going on, environmental political strife. Like, do you like if you have the energy in your day to like have an issue with someone or like project negativity onto someone? I promise you, you are not prioritizing your energy correctly. There are areas of your life I don't even need to know you. There are 
areas in your life, you could better spend that energy and in a positive way. So uh, take a deep breath and have a think about that pretty please. Um, do you all think that as a gainer community, maybe we need to do more to connect with other fetish communities? Ooh, I think we yeah, do. Definitely, yeah, no. I think I definitely, we definitely have to. Um, I think that what we were going off is just like, you know, we should be more accepting to people wanting to open more about their sexual preferences and sexual orientation, sexual, you know, everything that deals with sexual. And I think we should all be learning to open our books and wanting to learn more, right? Like we have opened our doors to the people who are into pup play. We open our doors to the people who are into, you know, padding, latex and stuff like that. And that's because, you know, we all share one thing and then that's like, just wanting to wanting to sexually please ourselves, right? And I think we everybody should be able to just wanting to, you know, we we are wanting to open that door for everybody. I believe so. I think we definitely should. I agree. And I think we also need to reach across the aisle to the heterosexual community in that regard as I well. Because there is a huge so... divide between feedy, feeder, feeders and feedies and gainers and encouragers. You know, we've made this designation and I don't know why other than other than I guess gay men or yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just say gay men, because if you go back far enough, that's just what they used to say, just the gay community. But like gay men seemed to love to have this division once upon a time. And I'm sure it stemmed from a place of fear, this idea that like if you didn't go to the gay bar, you wouldn't be safe. If you didn't go to the bathhouse, you wouldn't be safe. But times have changed drastically. Yeah. And a lot of queer youth today doesn't even, they don't even go to designated queer spaces. They just go wherever the hell they want. Yeah. So I think we need to reach over the fence and like welcome in women and straight men and, and, and we need more trans um, uh, individuals as well. We need more of that as representation. Like I'm, yeah. I think we're just reaching a point where we're sick and tired of feeling separated from everything. Yeah. I, I also find that um, there's a few people who are straight and they're really accepting of the gay people messaging them, you know, commenting on the videos and everything. And then that's true. That's fine, you know. And then there's the other the gay men who are like, oh, you should be gay. You know, you should like come to our side. I'm like, no, they're, if they're straight, they're straight, right? It's just like, we're gay, we're gay, we're bi, we're bi, we're pan, we're pan, you know, all these things, you know. And I think we should definitely, you know, have a space where everybody's welcome especially our trans people. I would say, especially our trans people, I'm a huge trans ally. I think that what's happening in the US is awful, but that's a whole different story right there. Yeah, that's no, a no. whole different Not, easy, not easy to live there. through right now, trust me. It's not easy to scroll through any news feed and, and see some of the shit that's going on. And you're just like, okay. it gets so discouraging. Honestly, I'm, I, if, it is, if there's any trans people, we are with you. And I think we should definitely be more acceptable with like accepting women and men, you know? I definitely think, I definitely 100% agree with that. Yeah. You know, Tim, honestly, the moment you said it, I was like, damn, I wish I got there first because truly like, and you know, you and I have had this conversation so much recently, especially because it was not so long ago that when we first decided, okay, let's make an effort to try and reach out to some feedies. There's gotta be some, there's gotta be people who wanna have a conversation with us. And we do have the blessing that this season, we have really, I think more than ever, found more and more people who wanna have these conversations with us, which is wonderful. But the truth of the matter is, that in and of itself has taken huge effort. And that's just crossing into just another division of this exact same fucking community. The walls we build up are so big and so powerful. Well, consider this, that consider the division between, so Grokio, Grokio owns four apps, right? They own Grommer, they own Chaseable, they own Phoebe, and they own Pupzone. And Furzu so, is five. Oh, oh, and Furzu, so they own five. They own five. Five things that all have a through line of fatness, and yet, like, it, it, it is like four, it's five separate kingdoms that don't communicate with each other at all. And even though you may have multiple profiles, on each of these, you know, respective apps, think about the engagement that you get from, like, if you're on Grommer as opposed to when you're on Chaseable, or you're on Pup Zone, uh, that rather than being on Furzu, it's like there could be, it, it could all be blended. It could have been one app. It could have been one app all along. 
Mm -hmm. but there's five of them. <laughs> I mean, we've talked about this before as well, like even just on that gendered basis, like if LGBT people, right, what, what are we meant to be percentage wise, like 20%? Of like the, the something the, yeah something like that that means that there is five times the number of straights right so that means if you are living in your town and you are legitimately legitimately the only person on grama in your town baby there could be five ten other people yes they're straight maybe they don't want to have sex with you but do you need to have that dick right now i don't know that you do if you just want a fat bitch to go get a slice of cake with what does it matter in fact solidarity bitch blending those lines <laughs> finding some friendship outside of all this this is a conversation we have to have more as homosexuals like i promise you you can be friends with people you don't want to fuck yeah. and well and i've said before i've said it before and i'll say it again i think this is going to lessen because gay men that are my age um we didn't have a lot of opportunity in it during our formative puberty years right a lot of us didn't get to go out on dates a lot of us didn't get to go to school dances with the people we wanted to go with so when we were finally loosed into the, the greater queer world it of course a lot of us wanted to have sex right away because we hadn't had it we had no idea you know and some of us found out we liked it some of us found out we hated it I, I do think that that's going to be a much different story by the time, like, say, the alpha generation is is reaching adulthood. I would agree with that, most definitely. So there is an author named Catherine Gates. She actually drew a map uh, for a book of hers that she wrote uh, back in 2006 called Deviant Desires. Have you seen this map before by any chance? I gave it a look the other day, and I was, like, very... I was, inter I was interested in this. I was like, mm. okay, I didn't, I, it was very confusing at first, but once I slowly started reading each and every single, you know, thing, I'm like, okay, I see what's the, what the map is going for now. I see what's happening. <laughs> Took me a bit for to understand it first. <laughs> yeah, there's layers upon layers of interpretation in terms of like, and listeners, go check it out. It's a fantastic little uh, piece that's been created. It's been adapted since then, and I'm sure there's parts that may or may not be relevant these days, but the general gist is that it's plotting different identities on a landscape based on what are the, ironically, macro concepts that link them together with other things. Um, and it's a very interesting concept because it really does show like the neighboring ideas of what is around us versus what is opposing to us and where we sit in the greater conjunction of all fetish, you know? Um, and to be clear, if you do look at that map, if you weren't already aware, the, the growth spectrum is an entire quadrant. Okay. So like in terms of what fetishes are understood in the broader spectrum, we take up as a whole a large portion which isn't that funny that as the fat bitches we take up a large amount of space on the fetish spectrum i feel like that's got to say something what are your thoughts on it tim um I, it's it's it, it was really fascinating when you showed it to me um because i had never really thought about it being mapped out like that before and then to see you know like I, of course i had known that there were going to be some connections between certain things but then when i saw how it kind of like would branch off one way and um, it was kind of like the the spokes of a wheel. It was almost like, mm. okay, this one particular thing connects to all these other things. And um, yeah, it was just a, a really fascinating look at how fetishes and possibly where they develop from. Because if you look at like the one that you've got, you can almost, when you see the line that connects to another one, you can say, oh, well, maybe that's the root of this. Maybe that's where this came from in my life to begin with. It is very fascinating, I think, to consider the broader spectrum and again, finding our place in that because it, it's, it's a little bit like when you're a kid and you see a world map for the first time and someone points out to you like this is where you are and this is the whole big thing that your brain has been processing up until this point. And then someone shows you the globe and you go, whoa, there is so much out there that goes far beyond anything I could have ever imagined. And it's a beautiful awakening. And I like that that's been the theme of today. There is this beautiful awakening that happens when you open yourselves up to other opportunities, other ideas, other potentials, and you allow yourself to explore that through joy rather than through that kind of carnal fear that sometimes we feed into. So I want to ask you all here, like, whenever something happens, right, in public regarding gaining or fetism, the typical response is that the community 
will shut down in a way. You know, like, let's say on Gromma, we know this, like, sometimes they shut down and, like, prevent new people from joining the site. And I think a lot of this idea comes from believing that the world is not ready for gaining and the fear of being treated poorly or being doxxed. But considering the history that other fetish communities have had when it comes to being out there and the similarities in the resources and the community size, do you all think that that fear is legit? Do you feel like it's reasonable or do you feel that maybe we need to challenge ourselves on that fear response a little bit? I think we should definitely challenge ourselves um, because I've been pretty open about that with my friends. You know, then they were like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, I'm into that. And they just kind of look at me and be like, okay. <laughs> you know, those people who are going to be very open-minded, people who are going to be open-minded, but they just don't care about it. And there's the other people where they just kind of look at you and be like, gross. I don't like that. Don't, t don't talk about that. But I've been lucky with a bunch of people who i just been open about it because, you know, like, it's true. I like bigger men. I like bigger men, you know, I've been pretty op open about it. You know, the only time I actually share my fetishes or anything like that is if it's have sexual parts. That's the only time. I don't need to share it with my friends that I'm just belly buttons or anything like that. Or, you know, I don't need to share that. That's like, you know, whatever. But on a kink level with this being on a gain gainer spectrum, I think I definitely are more open about it being, you know, I'm into bigger guys. And I've been really honest with a bunch of people before, but I can see what it means that other people are not comfortable sharing that, right? Because yes, I did fear that for a long time. I did fear even just the idea of just like in a bigger guy was scary because I like that, right? And that's always been, you know, it's mostly has to do with phobia. That's what it mostly it is, right? So, and that's a lot of the internalized fat phobia and externalized fat phobia and everything. And it puts a image on us that we're into something disgusting. You know, wherever you go, you can't be fat anymore. You know, you can't be fat. You have to be skinny. Like the models on the freaking thing, on the bail billboards, the, the posters, propaganda, you have to be skinny. And you can't like somebody because, you know, they're not... They're not fitting the social norm of what people are expect. You have to like a certain people, you know. But me, I like the fat guys. I've always have liked the fat guys, but especially when TV shows when they're like, "Oh, let's gain weight," you know, like Homer Simpson that one episode where he wants to be a fat guy. I was, I was very, I was so shocked about that. That was like a very good episode for me because <laughs> it's like. You know, that's what I like. That's what I like. And I think it's already in the public view. I just think ignore, they keep it as more of like a comic relief kind of thing, a funny thing. That part. I don't find it funny. I find it really sexual for me. But for other people, it's a funny thing or it's a gross thing or it's not something that should not be, you know, internalized or externalized or anything like that. It's, it should not exist. But for those, a whole lot of people that who believe it, they want it. I want it to exist. I want people to go out there and be like, yeah, I'm into fat man, whatever, and not be hate crime three, you know? <laughs> very that, very, very that. I mean, ask yourself this. Has there ever been a good time to talk about anything ever? Because everyone always says that, oh, it's not the right time to talk about it. Like, how many times have you heard someone say that throughout the course of your life? Now is not the time to talk about that. Well, when the fuck is the time to talk about it? You know, everything that ever challenged a social norm or challenged the, uh, an established system, people have always said, now is not the time to talk about it. Well, fuck you, I'm going to talk about it anyway, because it needs to be. And I understand the fear that people have about being um, open with it, because there's two things that tend to happen. One, we don't get the best representation when someone decides to write an expose or give an interview or, God forbid, a scandal come along. You know, that's not good representation for the community. But we'll, we're never going to get anywhere if if the minute that we that like people get a, a whiff of of us or what we're doing or or the spaces that we hang out if we all start burying our heads in the sand where 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 the fuck are you going to go from there mm. you know um, the only way that things can be made more I guess typical like if you look at leather most people don't bat an eyelash at that 
is to to challenge ourselves to not run away at the instance of oh god somebody knows about us quick hide now there are some professions i know that are very different like if you work for the government if you work in education there are a lot of restrictions that are put on you some states will fire you outright if they find out that you are doing like if you're a teacher in a certain state and they find out something about you they could fire you on the spot it, it is dangerous for some people to be public about it. But in the main, most of us have jobs that aren't going to do that to us, right? Like I'm a nurse. And if I went and sat down for a job interview and the interviewee or the interviewer is <clears throat> uh, brings up, you know, um, so we did a little bit of research on you. And uh, can you explain this? And if I turned it around and it was my OnlyFans page or something, I'd be like, what, what does that have to do with anything? There's nothing to do with how I do my job. There's nothing to do with my skill set whatsoever. So if this is you saying that I'm going to cast a bad light on your company, I don't want to work for your company. 100. Also, I'd be thinking, you found my OnlyFans. I don't have my name on there, bitch. Why are you looking for my dick on the internet? Why are you, prospective employer, looking to fucking fold my fucking foreskin, lick the lint out of my belly button? Why are you hunting this down? Like, honestly... The reflection is way worse. You're literally trying to say, oh, we found this about you online as if that's a big gotcha. Baby, you are a respectable business looking for pornographic content as a way to gotcha someone. Let's talk about how creepy the fuck that is, right? Yeah. We got to learn to turn these things around because shit ain't going to change. Just like you were saying, Tim, shit ain't going to change until we make the point to change it. Think about the narrative of homosexuality in and of itself. There was a point in human history, which is still ongoing for some people, where if you come out, if someone asks you, are you gay? And you say, yeah. And you look nervous and shy and shameful. Then of course it's going to make people think that there's something wrong and shameful for being gay. And I'm not trying to be out here blaming teenagers for this shit. Do not have that interpretation, people. You know that's not what we're on about. But what we are talking about is owning your shit. If someone actually came up to you and said, oh, so you want to be fat? Uh, yeah. Totally, <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. baby. So does most of America, apparently. Have you looked around? <laughs> Girl, like, take that fire, douse it in water. Choke the flames. Smoke it and smother it out. Don't let the spark and the flame continue. Fucking cut it off at the source. Deal with it. Jump on it. And obviously, this is not us saying that you have to come out. And I feel like that's been another theme this season. Like, we are not saying declare it from the heavens that you are a gainer. But I'm just saying, girly, stand your ground. Yeah. You fat. It's, you heavy. You are hard to move. Stand your ground. It's not that we're advocating, like, oh, you have to be balls to the wall if you're serious. It's more like there, you just, you don't, don't, don't allow yourself to feel ashamed of it. Because once you feel that you're already vulnerable and people can exploit that if you're not ashamed of it if if someone if someone in your life whoever they may be comes up to you and is like i heard that you're trying to get fat and i think that's disgusting you say to them well then why are you talking to me why are we friends why are you in my life you're clearly you know gonna judge me for something that has nothing to do with anything i don't need you around you think fat people are disgusting? You know that your obesity is an inevitability. Therefore, you know that their hatred of you is an inevitability. So do not feel precious about protecting that friendship because, baby, they're not going to feel precious about you. You're in a position of authority. Take action. Cut them out of your life. Like, you have permission at every point to do what is right for you. And I think what we can take from today's conversation, where are we in the fetish spectrum? Coming back to reality, oh, there goes gravity, right? That who and what we are is not some isolated island in the middle of the ocean where we wail and moan and beat our hands against the beach, screaming for salvation. No, we're actually just at the Jimmy John's down the road. Like, everybody's queued up next to us. Like, we are in the thick, literally, of all this fetish goodness. And when we ostracize ourselves we are actually responsible for bringing ourselves back to the conversation. So listen, as a last question for today, I want to ask you here, Ed, like, what do you see for the future of gaining? Like, do you see a future where we become more integrated with other aspects of kink and fetish? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we are already in the cartoons. <laughs> I a hundred percent believe that there is definitely those people were 
definitely has, you know, said, you know, planted things already. Yeah. But I definitely hundred percent agree that I think there's gonna there's gonna be a future where we're just gonna be open about it. Like just like fairies and leather people and all that stuff like that, they're slowly becoming well, leather people are already out there, but like the more the yeah. fairy community and more like the people who, you know, who are part of that a different community are becoming more prominent in these days. And I think it's slowly also becoming this one here because I see a few guys in public doing stuff and you know that they don't, I don't see other people going up to them and like, that's disgusting, you know, the people that mind their own business, right? As they should be, you know, minding their own, their own business, especially when it's like, you know, I've been invited to a, um, a, like a dinner with a bunch of other guys from Grammar. I didn't go, unfortunately, because I worked that day. I was so sad. And yeah, I don't think it should not be a big deal. I, you know, deal for anybody else because it's like that's not relevant to, to you because we're just comfortable within ourselves. And I think it's something that, you know, I think people should accept because as as you said before, the US is already fat. <laughs> like come on. <laughs> how how could how could you not like how could you not like not accept that? Because you know you're accepting with Burger King giving you or McDonald's giving you really high fat things already. So, I mean, how can we help ourselves, right? So, I mean, but yes, I I think we should definitely be more mainstream and not scared to be part of our community because we are, we are who we are, and you know, and I, I love I love myself, I love myself and all the people who are accepting for who they are, right? And I'm, you know, if you're not accepting of yourself, it takes time. That's for sure. It took me a while to accept myself. I think it took about like six years to even just open up a video and actually masturbate to it and actually feel comfortable not feeling ashamed. You know, I still feel ashamed around like other people because I used to hide that. A little, a little personal story on that. My mom came up to me one time and she asked me, why did I find a fat man on your video? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I just, it just popped up, right? <laughs> I think that's also what it's like, it's that conversation you need to have with yourself if you're willing to, you know, be open about it and wanting to be open in the public and everything. And it takes time. For me, I accept it. Everybody knows that I like fat men. And they know that I gained reason, gained weight for a reason. And I think it's, it's depending on the person who is willing to be so open about it and so ready to be, you know, in the public about it. Mm. I mean, I definitely see a future where gaining, it's not about like, and I know we use like that term mainstream, right? Like people ask the same thing of like RuPaul, will drag ever be mainstream? And I think it's the same kind of response where it's like, like, what does it mean to be mainstream? Like what we are at the end of the day is what we are. Like we're not a trend or a fad, but what we are representative of is the reality that many people experience, like size and body shifts, which is common for literally 100% of the population, like everybody's body changes. Your body is not the same body as it was when you were first birthed. Your body grows and transforms. We represent the joy and yes, to an extent, the sex, the kink, the pleasure, but we represent happiness and we represent fulfillment and we represent confidence. So I do see that future for us. Tim, what do you think? Uh, it's kind of a long answer, but stick with me. Um, I do think it's inevitable for it to be more accepted. I don't think it's ever going to be mainstream because, like you said, what does that even mean? Um, it's going to be an uphill battle, though. It's going to be a real uphill battle because there's the medical industry working against us. And then there's just people in general who kind of want everyone to go back to hiding everything about themselves you know, the uber conservative people that push their children out in front of them and say, I don't want you exposing my kids to this, that, and the other. And it's, it's like, it, it's going to be a long, hard road to walk, but I do think that people will either not give a shit at all or, or just have, or, or just, you know, like, I don't know, have their minds changed, I guess, by somebody being completely open with them about it. Like we know the people that are against everything because you, they loudly proclaim that they're against everything. Just avoid those people. And, and actually they make up a smaller percentage of the population than we think. And um, I, I kind of love using this particular example. <laughs> this is about my mother. Um, she actually ran into a group of furries 
um, she uh, she does um, sales repping for a publishing company, and um, she was um, being put up in a hotel somewhere. Uh, and her the end of her stay butted up against a furry convention that was coming into that hotel. And she um, was talking to me after she got back from her business trip. And she's like, have you ever heard of this thing called furries? And I was like, yeah, well, how did you find out about it? And she's like, well, they were having this furry convention the day before I was leaving the hotel. And she goes, and you know, those boys put so much effort into that. Their costumes are so elaborate. They like... They're so colorful and they have like little costumes that go on their fursuits and like the eyes move and the mouths move even. And she's like, they're so creative. They could, they, they could be working for Disney. They're better than any mascot you see. And, you know, she's like, she did ask, well, what do they do when they put those suits on? And I was just going to have a standard answer of something like, oh, well, they just sit down and have tea or something. <laughs> I didn't know what to tell her. But I was like, well, what do you think they do? And she goes, oh, okay. <laughs> and she just moved on. But she didn't give a shit. Like, she was in a hotel full of, um, well, I mean, I, I guess she couldn't tell if they were all, you know, uh, cisgendered or, or not. But, like, you know, because behind the suit, how can you tell? But, she, you know, no immediate judgment. No immediate, like, oh, what, are they Are they into bestiality? Do they do this just because they can't have sex with real animals? You know, none of that. Like she just applauded their creativity and talked about how elaborate their costumes were. So, and I think that that is the actual general opinion of the public is that they really don't care. It's unfortunate that because of the way that media is structured in pretty much every country, you know, like the media always wants to get that, that clickbait, that soundbite, that scandalous headline. And, and, you know, they, they print these salacious articles. So it, I think that's why we have built up this belief in our head that everybody hates us. But really, if they found out, they're really not going to give a shit. So many of them will, but the majority won't. Hmm. I think this is a great place to leave the episode. I really hope the takeaway for people today is the knowledge that we are not alone in all of this. We are surrounded by people who understand us to a greater extent, a far greater extent than maybe we want to believe that they do. I mean, for goodness sake, this is why we start interviewing people from other podcasts, from other communities, because we're trying to draw the lines here, people. We're trying to make it obvious. Like, people don't give as much of a shit as you think they do. And the people who think poorly or negatively of us, there are way more of us than there are of them. I, I just wanted to end on one thing weirdly enough i've gotten more judgment over being a puppy than anything else really yes oh, wow. oh. i've gotten more judgment from from just regular people about being a puppy than than any other thing i've ever talked about hmm. because they see it as they see it as be, as like becoming non-human you know it's like, like a, they see it as a dehumanization thing no no not even a bestiality thing they see it as a dehumanization thing like why do you want to be dehumanized as a form of pleasure that's what they had the issue with interesting interesting we are going to have to explore more of that on a future episode but listen ed this has been a wonderful wonderful uh week on the podcast i think thank you so much for being with us today where can our listeners find you online um you can find me on grammar um instagram twitter um and a porn site this vid so <laughs> all on the same username uncool axel my instagram is a different one only because i have a bunch of people on there that i don't want to see so <laughs> i try to I, I mix it up on that one it should be under i think hold on i think i think hold on give me a quick second here let me quickly see here it should be under mr mr mixel axel dexel Lover. <laughs> That's a mouthful. <laughs> just, I just don't want anybody, to find, um, the people that are close to me find me. My fiance, he did find that Instagram. He kind of judged me for it, so I changed the name. <laughs> so, yeah, that's why that's why I, I changed it to a very long name. So <laughs> we will make sure to put that one in the show notes, but that is a wrap for now here on thick radio. Please remember to like, and subscribe, rate us five stars and leave us a good review. 
Now, if you liked this episode, the podcast, or just us in general, share it with your friends and encourage them to tune in. You can find me on Instagram and Blue Sky at Stanham. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok at Thicky Mouse. You can also look us up on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Thick Radio, or at our website at podpage.com forward slash Thick Radio. If you want to submit a voice note or become a financial supporter of the show, you can find the links in the show notes. And you can always write to us at thethickradio at gmail.com. So until next time, bye fats. Bye fats. Bye fats. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Thick Radio is a Patreon and Anchor app podcast produced by Stan and Thicky Mouse. Next and Master by Stan. Our artwork is provided by Lucky 2. Our theme song is provided by Spotify Training.